All right, Jeff, I uh, I got 1 o'clock on my watch. Okay if I kick us off officially? That'd be perfect. All right, cool. Well, good afternoon, everyone, if you're on the East Coast, and good morning if you are on the West Coast or somewhere in between. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's webinar, The Art and Science of Volunteer Development. And my name is Stephen Shattuck, and I am the Chief Engagement Officer over here at Bloomerang, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. And before we begin, just want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Just want to let you all know that we are recording this presentation, uh, and we'll be sending out that recording as well as the slides later on this afternoon, just in case you didn't already get the slides. Uh, so if you have to leave early, or perhaps you want to watch the presentation again with a colleague or share it with someone, uh, you will be able to do that. Have no fear. We'll send out that recording later on today. And as you are listening today, please feel free to chat in any questions uh, during the presentation. We're going to save as much time as possible uh, towards the end for Q&A. So don't be shy about that at all. Uh, we'd love to hear your questions and comments and, and make it as interactive as we can towards the end. You can follow along today uh, via Twitter with hashtag Bloomerang, and our username is at Bloomerang Tech. I'll be keeping an eye on those tweets as well, so love to see you, you hanging out there as well. Um, and if you are listening today via your computer, uh, just know that these webinars, the quality of them is usually as good as the speed of your internet connection. So if you have any trouble, um, usually the audio quality is a little bit better by phone. So if you're listening via your computer today and have any issues, uh, and if you can dial in by phone and don't mind doing that, it's usually a little bit better. Uh, you'll find a phone number in the email from ReadyTalk with all that information. If this is your first Bloomerang webinar, just want to say a special welcome to you folks. Uh, we do do these webinars just about every Thursday. Uh, but in addition to that, if you don't know much about Bloomerang, we offer uh, donor management software. So if you are interested in that or want to learn more, just check out our website. You can look at our product. You can watch a short video demo, learn all about us. Uh, and we'd love for you to check that out if you are interested. But for now, I'm really excited uh, to introduce today's guest, uh, one of my favorites. He's joining us from Nashville. He's a fine Southern gentleman, uh, Jeff Jowdy. Jeff, how's it going, my friend? It is awesome. It's good to be with you, Stephen. It's good to have you. We, we tried this last June, but our technology failed, and uh, Jeff was good enough to, to give us another try. So thank you, Jeff, first of all, for doing that. We love having you. You've been a, a mainstay on our webinar series for years and years. And uh, if, if you are listening today and you were on that June webinar that crashed, I really appreciate you coming back as well. Uh, definitely going to be worth the wait. Uh, great presentation in store for you. Um, if you guys don't know Jeff, you got to know him. I just want to brag about him for a minute here before he takes over. Uh, Jeff is the founder over at Lighthouse Council, where he's been helping nonprofits uh, all the way back since 1999 at Lighthouse Council. Uh, he has worked in the nonprofit sector, basically every job that you can name. He's had that title. Uh, he was previously Senior Vice President of Development uh, for the YMCA in Middle Tennessee. He was a Senior Managing Director at Gerald Panis Lindsay & Partners, another really great agency. Uh, he was also the ED for the March of Dimes, uh, and he also served as an Advancement Director at an independent school as well. He is super active in the sector. He is a past president of the Nashville chapter of AFP. Uh, where actually he was recognized as their fundraising professional of the year. No doubt uh, in my mind that he was deserving of that. Uh, he's currently a member of the Atlanta and Nashville AFP chapters, the Rotary Club of Nashville, and the Sons of the American Revolution Tennessee Cedars Club. Jeff, I don't know how you have time to do all this and do a webinar for us, but I'm glad you do. Um, so I'm going to pipe down. I'm going to let you take over and uh, tell, tell us all about uh, volunteer development. So take it away, my friend. Great. Thank you, Stephen, and good afternoon, everybody. Really appreciate uh, each of you for being here and sharing, and, and in particular, looking forward to your <coughs> excuse me questions and dialogue. And a special thanks to Stephen and the team at Bloomerang. And if you are, I'll, I'll give you the our hearty endorsement. We have referred many, many clients to Bloomerang, and they have all been thrilled. And not only quality products, but in our eyes even as important or more important is the caliber of team uh, Stephen and and everyone at Bloomerang. So if you're looking for uh, software, there's uh, no finer place to look than Bloomerang. So thank you for being here today and a topic that uh, is exciting to me and that is the art and science of volunteer 
development. And volunteerism is very important to me personally because I had a great mother who was a role model her entire life up until her 90s in terms of volunteering and service to others. And that is a huge factor in why today I'm privileged to partner with uh, organizations like many of you represent and help you increase your effectiveness. So volunteerism is a very important topic to me. And <coughs> excuse me, and certainly uh, one that's important to our, our sector. So today we're going to be talking about what is the role of volunteers today. Uh, many nonprofits are focusing more and more on staff, and then there's a wave now that we see that many, many are realizing, well, we've focused on staff and we haven't paid enough attention to the volunteer resources. And managing volunteers can be more of a challenge uh, than managing staff. And if this was a video conference and I can see some of your faces, there are probably some pretty funny expressions. And you thought about some of your great volunteer experiences, but also some of the challenges uh, with volunteers. So why bother? Why would you put the efforts into a volunteer program? And a strong partnership between staff and volunteers creates synergy and energy uh, that's undeniable. It enriches the organization. It enriches the staff because we are better as staff leaders working with volunteers who inspire us and, yes, sometimes challenge us. Uh, and it certainly enriches the life of the volunteers, as we'll talk about in a minute. It provides leverage. There's a great leadership principle called leveraging. And when we work alone, we can only do the work of one person. When we leverage other staff, or in this case, volunteers, it's going to save staff money. It's going to increase the connections for our nonprofits, and it should improve efficiency. Another point is, <clears throat> excuse me, that volunteers and their roles will evolve as an organization grows and evolves. If you're a grassroots organization, if you're the founder, or you at an organization, a nonprofit that's a couple of years old, then uh, your highest level volunteers, your board members. Uh, may be A, all your volunteers, and B, their major duty beyond a board meeting might be stuffing envelopes or putting up chairs for an event. And then as your organization matures, that the roles of the volunteers uh, and the board become different and more complex. And really there's an important part that we'd encourage you overall, and before we delve into the topic in particular, is always to think of when you think of a volunteer. This is much like the uh, real estate terminology that a, you know, a piece of property is valued at its highest and best use. And so we want to value a volunteer at his or her highest and best use. And that is, what is it they can do most effectively for your organization, and what is it that they enjoy most? So I encourage you to always think about those two principles. And then one of the, of course, benefits, and love this quote, build your reputation by helping others build theirs. And this reflection, this uh, halo effect, if you would, casts both ways, that if you're a volunteer with an incredible organization, then your affi that affiliation reflects positively on you. And likewise, if you're an organization and have incredible volunteers working with you, that will cast a very positive light on the organization. And that can be really important and strategic for an organization that is looking for early wins that may not be as established and are as well known. And if you can get some volunteers who are more highly visible and connected in the community and not even as board members, but in any capacity, then that will begin to uh, enrich your reputation and your ability to connect with other volunteers. Now, one of the great sayings that uh, that I love are that people are people, and art and science of volunteerism is an important balance. And it's an art because it's rooted in relationships, founded in friendships. There's no cookie cutter approaches, and again, people are people. And I'll laugh and say that sometimes uh, we can all relate to this. People are different hour by hour or day by day. I know none of you have encountered someone where you think, gosh, who was that I just spoke with? I want the uh, my, my, my colleague or my spouse or my kids that I was talking to yesterday. So people are people. 
And it's a science in that uh, there are established systems for success that we know that to be most successful, you want to know the interests, abilities, and motivations of volunteers, and that the culture and capacity of an organization is very important. So the culture speaks to what volunteer roles do you have and are they appropriate for who you are. And very important is capacity. If you embark on a volunteer program, much like a donor relationship, I would encourage you to think of this as a trust. And you're offering uh, a relationship and exchange with an individual, and so each brings a commitment to the table. And while volunteers may not always fulfill their commitment, we as nonprofit leaders have an obligation to always fulfill our commitment to volunteers. And yes, we may fall short from time to time, but be careful. We say capacity of an organization that if you're going to embark, you're going to enrich, you're going to grow, <clears throat> excuse me, a volunteer program, that you have what it takes to be successful. <clears throat> and I apologize. I'm battling bronchitis, so as I cough a few times, please forgive me. So what does it take to succeed in a, in a volunteer program? What are the benefits of volunteering for your organization? So think about that. What are the advantages? A volunteer, much like a young donor, have the opportunity to uh, provide services at a multitude of organizations. So what is it about your organization that will compel and encourage and motivate a volunteer? And how does your nonprofit benefit from the volunteer program? Again, you're going to make a commitment of resources, so there needs to be, to, for the fulfillment of your mission and the people that you're serving with your worthy mission, there needs to be a clear benefit to and defined a benefit to the organization. And then three, <clears throat> what does it make uh, for a positive volunteer experience? So be sure that you can identify all of these things, and we'll be discussing them in more detail uh, in a few minutes. So let's look at volunteerism in America, and one of the great things is that overall that the America had has one of the highest, not the highest, but one of the highest rates of volunteering uh, in the world. And on average, you can see there that um, nearly half of adults over 21 formally volunteered, almost two-thirds volunteered on a monthly basis, and they gave an incredible value in hours, <coughs> excuse me, and in time to the nonprofit sector. But statistics also show that a growing number of individuals, and I think from our own personal experience and from the challenges that you might have encountered and from your own uh, organizations, uh, surveys show that volunteering is not as prevalent as it was in past generations. That volunteers, some people feel in that first slide where we talked about the halo effect, that some volunteers are mo more motivated by self-benefit <clears throat> than what they can do with than others. But really importantly, that two-thirds feel that true philanthropy includes giving time and money. So time and money. So there's really great benefits to volunteering, and one of them you can see here uh, the people who volunteer tend to ha have the highest self-esteem, psychological well-being, and happiness. I understand that, uh, that when people have different issues in their life, that oftentimes counselors and, <clears throat> and psychologists encourage them you know, to get beyond themselves and to help others. And when giving, helping to others, it lets, helps them forget about their own challenges. So there are definite phys physiological, uh, you know, emotional, proven scientific benefits to, to doing good and to volunteerism. 
So why volunteer? It's to support causes you care about. It's the right thing to do in our culture in America, and we talked about that we're one of the highest in um, in the country in, in volunteerism. <clears throat> it fills a, a great need in the community. You set an example. I mentioned my mother and the, the lasting impact that she had on, on my volunteering in my career. And you all have people in your own lives that have been those examples and why you're involved in the nonprofit sector today and why you each volunteer. <clears throat> Volunteering helps people stay active. So depending on what stage of life you're in, it can uh, be a huge, again, benefit. People want to feel useful and needed, and volunteering can help with networking professionally. One of the greatest things, we've got several friends in the search world, and when people might be between jobs, uh, most of them, their first advice is to go volunteer somewhere and to have an, a, an affiliation with an organization. So there are great reasons and benefits to volunteering. Some more include it expands your horizons. You will learn new skills. You meet new people. Uh, if there are students involved, again, the statistics show that volunteering in high school and in college improve academic success. You mentioned the career opportunities, so either by that halo effect of your doing good in a good organization or learning new skills, it advances career opportunities. It builds a sense of community in your community. Uh, one of the incredible things is, and again, this is based on research, that volunteering and giving time makes you feel like you have more time. We mentioned before about the physiological effects. It leads to better health promotes personal growth and self-esteem, keeps you busy, and then just the values, the humanitarian and possibly religious values uh, that, uh, that people believe in helping and serving others. So if uh, with all those benefits of why volunteering, if there was a pill that uh, you could go to the doctor and say, give me the pill, I want these benefits, uh, then volunteering certainly is a great, a great medicine for, for the worthy nonprofits, you, those you serve, your community, and the volunteers themselves. So what factors, when you're in a mode of recruiting volunteers, and we well know it's a competitive arena, what factors do volunteers consider when they look at serving a worthy organization? And first, the mission and work of the organization. So we all know, and again, much like donors, that every mission, every program is not going to resonate with everyone. But your opportunity is to find volunteers who get excited about your mission and the work that you do. Next is the reputation of the organization. People want to be a worthwhile member of a worthwhile cause. And so most volunteers are going to be looking for an organization with a stellar reputation. Volunteers want to, in most cases, be able to use skill sets they have. We talked about sometimes they want to learn new skills, but in many cases they're going to bring to the table certain talents and experiences, and they want to be able to use those. Another big factor in the earlier slide you saw the average number of hours that volunteers put in. Again, we know about averages, so there are many that are far above and there are many that are far below, but they want to find a match that uh, the type of volunteer work and the hours required. So do you have a volunteer opportunity that's maybe an hour or two a month at their leisure, at their time, or do you have a regimented schedule where they need to be somewhere every day, every other day, or what is it? And different opportunities are going to motivate different people. We put convenient location. Now, in today's uh, technology, and depending on the, the skill set, you may have volunteers that are, and we'll talk more about this, that are on a committee or a task force and never have to come in for a meeting and maybe do a conference call, or they may do research or who knows what. Uh, and But for most volunteers, they're, they may be on site uh, in your program areas, at, at your school, at your hospital, 
and at your clinic, and so they want a convenient location. But <coughs> and then also, back to the halo effect, if they have friends and family and coworkers who say, you really should volunteer at the clinic. I volunteer at the clinic and I have an incredible experience, and that certainly is going to mean a lot to the potential volunteers to attract them to your organization. How about the benefits to the nonprofit? And again, I encourage you that if you're going to have a volunteer program, that it takes a formal commitment that you want to identify these tangible benefits. So what are the specific benefits and how are you going to measure the uh, advantages of having volunteers? So first, a volunteer, we talked about the 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 billions of dollars in, in volunteer hours that were given, so it should save resources. It might save you from additional part or full-time people. It might save you if you have an accountant or an attorney providing volunteer service. It might save you if you have a painter providing volunteer service, but it should save your nonprofit resource. It adds expertise that your nonprofit may not currently have. And that can be in many, many areas. You know, volunteers can bring a great excitement to your organization. And volunteers of all ages, volunteers might be high school, college students. They might be senior citizens. Uh, they might be even uh, citizens with some uh, disabilities that they're able to serve your organization. It builds community and creates some more excitement uh, when you get volunteers involved in meaningful projects. <clears throat> An important piece of volunteer benefits, and when you look at uh, an organization that might be larger or smaller, but you're looking at future board members, you can identify, groom, and test future leaders. So oftentimes the, the uh, future board members of an organization start as volunteers at different levels, and they they uh, rise to the top, so to speak. One of the great things, too, about volunteers in fundraising campaigns is if someone does really well on a campaign steering committee and they're effective and they're collegial and they know how to work together, then you know they'd be great board members. Now, if you add how many of it is, but you want all of your staff out in the community being ambassadors, but if you have scores or hundreds or thousands of volunteers uh, in the community, in the region, uh, across the nation, across the world, then it's going to strengthen the awareness of your organization. And then back again to that early kind of halo slide, it's going to enhance your image. So there are certainly many, many benefits to the non volunteer and to the nonprofit. So now let's talk about the types of volunteers that your organization uh, may have. You, know, you can have a one-time volunteer opportunity. You may be uh, working on a building addition, and you might have people in the service trade come in for one day, one week, one weekend, and help build that out. You might have a accounting issue where you secure the volunteer service of an accountant to help guide you through that. You might need fundraising help and even uh, get the volunteer service of an experienced fundraising professional. So it, uh, it can be one time or ongoing. And a lot of times the, <coughs> excuse me, the ongoing would include uh, projects, you know, serving on committees, serving on affiliate groups like auxiliary groups and parent groups, serving on advisory boards and boards. So again, be thinking when you're developing, refining, and growing your volunteer program, what are one-time opportunities <coughs> and what are ongoing opportunities. And as you might imagine, oftentimes it is the one-time opportunities to get someone in and hooked, you know, 
Susan, I need your help, or we've got an accounting issue. Could you spend two hours and review these and give us your advice? Oh, sure, I can spend two hours. And then successful experience, and that grows and builds. So a one-time opportunity or or ongoing opportunities through advisory groups, again, boards, affiliate groups, auxiliaries. Okay. And then when you're providing the experience for a volunteer program, uh, in, in today's world, for a number of reasons, you're going to want to do some screening. You're going to want to do background screening uh, for many organizations if you're dealing with with uh, youth or children or even sen seniors, whatever it might be, patients. There are different volunteer opportunities where you're going to have to do some you know, criminal and other background screening. You want to do some screening to match the skills to the opportunity. I have no, and, and uh, Stephen is too aware of this, and I didn't cause the crash of our last webinar, I'd like to think it was the incredible, wonderful participants and how many there were, uh, but, uh, but I would not be a good volunteer for anything that included technology. I, it's just not my aptitude. I would fail. I would be miserable. So you want to match the skills. And then very importantly, too, is personality. You want to know... Does that person work well with others? Are they liked? Would they be better off working on their own versus with a team? So that's very important, that whole screening process for your volunteers. Then to provide an orientation program for the volunteers about your organization, the mission. They are part of the family now, so orient them much like you would a new employee and then the education, and that's ongoing, but that's about the role they will be provided, or providing rather, and giving them you know, ongoing feedback. So when you think about uh, providing the volunteer experience, some of the things that you'll want to do, again, is we talked about is uh, assessing and prioritizing your needs articulating what the benefits are to the volunteers you're going to recruit, do a profile of the volunteer skills and proficiencies needed. We're huge fans of job descriptions. Even if it's a simple volunteer task, people want to know what is it I'm going to do and what's expected. Put it in writing. If it's three lines, put it in writing. Review it with a volunteer as a part of that orientation and, and or education and ask them, you know, review that regularly and give them the opportunity to change that and grow. Develop plans to maximizing your volunteer efforts and how you're leveraging the volunteers and really engage your whole organization because your organization needs to be aware everyone will be a part of providing an incredible volunteer experience. So you want to be sure to also that <clears throat> you have the support that you need, that you have a plan to recruit the volunteers. We mentioned earlier the volunteer benefits. What is it they're going to receive? It could be just that uh, feeling, good feeling, or it could be tangible benefits. That they get a parking place. They get discount on food. But what are the benefits you might offer? Discount on shows. Uh, and then get feedback on an ongoing basis from your volunteers. How's it going? How are we doing? And how can we do better? So acquire feedback and consider conducting focus groups, interviews, and surveys. And then we all know from being in the nonprofit arena uh, that we've got to be recognizing and thanking our volunteers. We want to build relationships with volunteers to give them a good experience. So this means an information exchange. How do they learn about other volunteers? Do you have a directory? How is it that you introduce people when they're working together on a project? 
how do you communicate with the volunteers through newsletters and other pieces? The interaction, and we mentioned that the whole organization is involved, uh, but they're spending time together and with leaders in your organization. And then giving, of course, is the volunteers are uh, giving of themselves, and we need to be grateful recipients of their volunteer service. And part of that being grateful recipients is showing appreciation. So what are some, some of the things that we can do to show appreciation to volunteers? Uh, one of the things we'd encourage you is to have a volunteer profile and to know when their birthday or anniversary or what other special times. So send a birthday card as appropriate for your organization. Send holiday cards. You know, National Volunteer Week is every spring. Make a big deal about National Volunteer Week. Uh, connect with your volunteers through notes and calls to say thank you. Uh, recognize and thank them. And again, we mentioned offering benefits, the regular communication. You know, they're a part of your team now, so share appropriate insider information. If you're going to make a major announcement, much like you would with donors, then share it with volunteers before it hits the media. They feel special. And very importantly, they're giving of their time, but also give them the opportunity and the honor of investing financially. Invite them to make a gift to your organization. So really, it's a win-win for the volunteer and the organization. It's a great opportunity for uh, getting don't gifts. Frankly, <coughs> we say investment. I'm sorry, involvement breeds investment. If you think uh, um, statistics show that where people are investing their time, they're likely to give more. And then know the art and the science, balancing these wonderful people that you have serving your organization with the process and know when to focus more on one area or another. So we'll have a great time in a few minutes to dialogue and answer your questions. Uh, thank you so much for being here today would uh, love for you to connect with me on lighthousecouncil.com for our blogs and podcasts and I uh, would encourage you to look at Nonprofit Pro uh, and where I have the honor of every Wednesday writing the Bedrocks and Beacons blog and if you're on uh, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, I would love to connect with you there. So thanks to each of you for being with us today and looking forward, uh, Stephen, to the questions. Yeah, we got some good ones already. But thanks, Jeff. That's really awesome information. I really love the, your tidbit about uh, letting volunteers know earlier than the public about things, kind of treating them like VIPs. That's a really good idea. I may put that into practice myself, actually. Um, we do have some questions. And please, we've got probably about, I'd say, 20 minutes for questions so we can make this super interactive. Um, we've got a lot here. I'll just kind of roll through them. Um, Jeff, there's a question here from Lou. Lou is wondering what strategy, strategies are effective with volunteers and board members who, who they eagerly promise to do things, but they don't actually follow through. How can you kind of get that follow through to happen um, uh, from those people? Any advice there? A absolutely. Good question. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, and, and b both are very similar, and we talked about some of those things. So if, if people aren't doing their job, we want to first look at ourselves, frankly, and mm -hmm. are we creating the right expectations? Do they know what's expected? I'll never forget when I was in college, I was asked by, uh, had no idea I'd be a fundraiser, but I was asked as a college student to be the fundraising chair for the American Heart Association in that community. And they gave me no guidance. <laughs> mm -hmm. They said, you're going to do this and you're going to, and, and go to it. And I thought, what? And and so you've got to be careful that these roles and all these things and the outcomes make you know, put everything in writing, everything that we've discussed today and and if you have additional questions, by the way, feel free to email me. Uh but 
put all those things in writing. So you start with, did we make expectations clear? Do we Have we recruited the right person, again, for the volunteer board role? Are the expectations mm-hmm. clear? Are we providing ongoing communication and feedback? Okay. And are we having conversations along the way? So uh, it would be like, uh, you know, whether how you might deal with your children or even an employee, uh, one of the worst things I hate is when, uh, you know, you have an annual evaluation, you're waiting all year to know how you did. And in, and so what you want to do is build in regular feedback, right, so that mm-hmm. even a volunteer hears regularly. So if there are problems, I'd encourage you, and, and it's tough sometimes, it's, again, like dealing with an employee. If you've got an issue, some of us prefer, prefer to avoid it. But if it's if you can be real specific and not personal and know how to approach someone about an issue in a non threatening way, just to educate and coach, you know, him or her. And then at some point, if it's a volunteer or board member and they're very different experiences though, if it's if uh you know, you're gonna have to have the conversation, uh, you know, what is it that we can do to help you be more effective, right? So mm-hmm. Uh, trying to get that information, and then at some point, again, you've got to decide they're not being effective, and it's taking it's more of a drain on the organization than the benefit. And being good stewards, we've got to make a change. So then you have, how do you do that? And you can do that in several ways. One, you can let people just fade away and roll off, and that's never ideal, but sometimes that may be the best option. Uh, what I would prefer, we would prefer, would be, for example, with a board m- member especially, if a board member is not fulfilling his or her responsibility, and even if they have a three-year term and you're into year one and they're not doing their job and you've given them regular feedback and they're not hitting attendance requirements or giving requirements or you know whatever it might be and you've communicated with them along the way where they're not going to be threatened, then we find that most people, if they're approached and say that, you know, maybe that this is too much of a commitment right now and would you want to consider rolling off or, you know, another volunteer opportunity and let someone else that might have more time, and people nine out of ten times respond well to that because a lot of times they know they're not doing well. People usually know how they're doing, and the opportunity to... Uh, you know, not have that commitment anymore and not having their anxiety and their stress, people really uh, respect that and, and are grateful for that. And I've seen that, that happen in organizations and then that volunteer come back in two or three or four years and either in a volunteer role or a board role, they're stellar. But we all know yep. that we mean we mean well. No one makes a commitment meaning not to complete it. But, uh, you know, work comes first. Life happens, health happens, finances happen, family issues happen, and that can change the initial desire and intent. So, again, if you stay in touch, communicate, get feedback, educate, then it really, do all those things, then uh, the opportunity to readjust involvement really can be a, a, a pretty easy conversation. Yep. So, Jeff, we've had a, a couple of people ask variations of the same question, so I'm just going to kind of sum it up uh, at this. Um, you've worked with tons of organizations, obviously. When do you recommend that someone hire a dedicated volunteer person? Is there mm-hmm. a size of org that you think is appropriate? Lots of people are asking, you know, when should we have that full-time person or that dedicated person, as, as dedicated as you can have someone in a nonprofit. Yeah. I know we, we, are, we wear a lot of hats, certainly, but what do yeah. you think about that? Yeah. Well, it, again, it depends back to, you know, who you are and what what is the role of volunteers. And mm-hmm. so if you, uh, you know, for example, health care, I can't imagine, and we've worked with hospitals and medical centers and clinics, I don't think we've ever had a client that didn't have a volunteer coordinator because mm-hmm. they are very heavy, you know, on volunteers still. Um, so really, it's the culture of your organization. The way I would put it, because you know, fundraising volunteers, for example, are are staffed and managed through the development office, right? 
So right. they're all those and hopefully legions that you have are, are taken care of through your development or advancement offices or alumni office. Um, and typically, you know, you have if you're a higher ed or or independent school or community college or what having education, you might have an alumni board that's uh, that might be staffed by an alumni staff, alumni director, uh, with uh, you know where much of their roles, frankly, are supporting volunteers, right? But o- overall, I wouldn't say a number. What I would say is. At what point do we risk not giving a good volunteer experience? And if we're in jeopardy, then it's time to look at hiring somebody. I love it. I love that answer. Um, here's an interesting one from Talia. Talia is wondering if you are new to the organization as that volunteer person, volunteer coordinator, volunteer manager, whatever it is, uh, wondering what's a good way to get better acquainted with the existing volunteers uh, who are already sort of part of the team or part of the process. Any advice for Talia there, new to the organization, yeah. wants to get acquainted with them? Yeah, and what a great opportunity for Talia. You know, whenever you're new, mm-hmm. you've got an excuse to reach out to people. Um, mm-hmm. It's that honey, honeymoon. It's the new CEO. So, but, there, but there are a lot of ways, and depending, you know, Talia, you might message how many volunteers you're talking about, but some of the ways that uh, I would suggest – you know, the, we all know that the number one best feedback is one-on-one, right? A conversation. So I would think, and again, not knowing details, but I would think, who are those that I can reach out to with a phone call, or take to breakfast, or have a handful of people do a little focus group? But what ways can I just say I'm new? I want to thank you for your volunteering. I want to meet, get to know you. And I want to know how we can make this a better experience for you. Mm-hmm. And then back to that feedback loop, if you're, you need to be every year doing that on an annual basis. So if, you're, if you've got a real volunteer program, you need to be surveying the volunteers every year and saying, how, how are we doing? Uh, mm-hmm. And I would supplement that with focus groups where you've got conversation. And if you can afford the time, and especially if you've got a structure, uh, then I would reach out, you know, sometimes you have a volunteer committee, leadership group, I would be meeting with them one-on-one. But the great thing is, uh, again, depending on the communications and what's been done, uh, Talia, a letter to all the volunteers saying, I'm new, I appreciate you, I might be reaching out, and then just a series of feedback opportunities. Love it. Very good. Well, I love everyone sending in questions. Keep them coming. We're going to try to get through as many as we can. Um, Here's one from Erica. Do you have any advice for engaging uh, one-time or first-time volunteers, maybe like a seasonal group or maybe uh, a for-profit, you know, corporate volunteer group? How do we engage them into a more long-term position? So I guess, you know, retaining to use uh, one of Bloomerang's favorite words yeah. is uh, the fir- that first-time volunteer and keep them keep them on there. Yeah. Well, you know, really, again, it's it's you know there are a lot of similarities between volunteers and donors, and of course we we really do. Mm-hmm. We want, I mean, if it's five dollars or a million dollars, we want our volunteers to be giving as well. Um, so I would think about it the same way is the best, uh, and this is something that Stephen and Adrian and Tom and company and and Jay are experts. You know, great giving experience leads to retention, right? Yep. So the same thing with volunteering. What is it? How do you make it a great experience, a wow experience? So, mm-hmm. you know, if it's a one time, then uh, you know, again, back to if you're the CEO or advancement or whatever your role is, and you reach out to someone for strategic advice or ask them, you know, for some help then you not only get their advice, but you close the loop, you let them know the end result, right? And you and you begin to stay in touch. It's not just a one-off. It's a relationship, right? So we want to keep yep. the relationship going. And the same thing for the – and love corporate programs for a number of reasons. And so if you have a corporate program, uh, back to defining how you do it, then do it better than anybody, right? Make the best – experience that company that corporation can have to 
bond their employees, to give all those benefits that we talked about earlier of volunteering to their employees, that magic pill of volunteerism, and let them want to come back. And again, it's just like donor retention. Don't have the event and not talk to them for a year. It's the follow-up. It's the pictures for the event. It's the thank you. It's getting them on your newsletter. It's three months later asking, you know, would you consider doing this again? So it's mm-hmm. uh, making a great experience, ongoing communication, doing the feedback, being sure you show, you know, show thanks and the benefit, and then stay in touch. Don't wait a year, and it's you know they help with the Oktoberfest and next September you're back in front of them. Yep. Well, I'm going to combine a couple other questions, Jeff. Uh, similar questions here. Hope you don't mind. A lot of people are asking about. Uh, millennials, younger volunteers. So, uh, as the the token millennial here, I'll I'll, I'll let you answer. Uh, how, how do you think you should engage uh, my age group? <laughs> well, if you look at the you know the and you have to answer this for me, but the <laughs> statistics on giving that a lot of millennials want to have more of a say and be self directive is that true? Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah, I would agree with that yeah. statement. Yeah. So then, uh, and and some of them want to be more independent. Uh, they're certainly very tech savvy. So I would I would consider all those factors. I also, we also find that they like. I mean, like everybody, they like to be social, right? And they like to mm-hmm. be with like people. Yeah. So, you know, when I was, <laughs> you'll laugh, but when I was in college, I volunteered at a at, um, through an organization at a senior center, and I just always loved older people. And I moved to another community, and I went to the senior organizations that I want to volunteer as a as a then millennial, and they thought I was crazy because <laughs> they they didn't have young people coming to ask to volunteer with old people. They were thinking, what does this guy want? And um, mm-hmm. so, but but the average is the reality that most people. Would rather be with people their own age, and, and by and large, for different activities, right? So, I would definitely have activities geared to them, both with interests and skills they bring, uh, and they you know, have a committee to help define some things in terms of what they do or don't do, what you offer, and uh, and and they definitely we we find that millennial donors, and especially high net worth, they want to be pretty directive sometimes with their giving and and. Same thing mm-hmm. with volunteerism. So, give them a chance to create the experience. Now, what's your answer, Stephen? You got to help me here. Yeah. <laughs> I'd agree with all that, you know. And I, you know, I don't really think that I I want something different than maybe you know a, a 55 year old potential volunteer would want necessarily. Um, yeah, I think that if you if you make the experience engaging. And, and you know worthwhile um, and fun, you, you know that's going to be attractive to every age group. Um, but uh, certainly reaching the different age groups, there's uh, there's going to be to some differences there. You know the communication channels that reach you know me at 32 may not be what reaches my dad at you know 62. Um, so I think I think it's more that you know that communication channel. And format rather than the the content or the angle of the messaging, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, so that was fun. We we tag team that one. That was fun, Jeff. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> um, got a couple other ones here. Here's one from Amanda, and we're probably we we'll probably have room for about maybe two or three more questions. So if you were sitting on your hands, uh, now's the time. Uh, I got one from Amanda, then Carl, I'm going to answer your question because I really like it. But Amanda is asking, uh, if you are starting your advisory committee or your your sort of uh, board that's going to handle the volunteer stuff, um, how often should that maybe volunteer committee meet? Um, What are some tips for getting that committee off the ground? Any advice for Amanda there, Jeff? I would. Well, first, uh, I would be sure you need it. So I mentioned that. Uh, and sometimes you don't need a group, so don't create something you can't sustain and it's not needed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you have a large volunteer program, if you've got, I think Talia said 50, and 
and that's probably getting fairly large. But if you got a, like a hospital, mm-hmm. I would have a volunteer council to give advice because it gives leadership and it gives, you know, part back to the question of how do you. Uh, get rid of a bad volunteer, well, it's easier to have a volunteer dealing with that than a staff person, right? So if you're getting a large, you know, 50, 100, several hundred volunteers, then you might want to think about having some kind of, uh, you know, volunteer council. And uh, that's when I would look at that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Along the same lines, Carl's wondering, how do you kind of navigate or manage the sort of interdepartmental relationships. So you got your volunteer person and maybe you have a fundraising staff or services staff who also sort of engages with the volunteers. How do you kind of sure. you know, navigate those waters when different departments are, are touching those volunteers? Sure. Well, traditionally, uh, with advancement or development especially, those volunteers relate to the, the development staff because that's very specific. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they would have their own committees and events and you know its whole schedule, and then a volunteer like at a medical center. So if I'm a volunteer at uh, a gala for the development office, you know I may get the volunteer newsletter, but I liaison with that department first. And and so it would be then what other departments you know might need volunteers. So, mm-hmm. again, at a major you know, medical center, typically a lot of those volunteer functions are, are really through the volunteer department and, and kind of ancillary to others. Uh, but I would identify, you know, back to the comment when we talked about that it's the cultural thing and throughout your organization you have to embrace volunteerism because the, the worst thing you can do is you have an incredible volunteer program and even have a full-time staff member and they send you to Department H and Department H is... The grumpy, <coughs> the grumpy department that would really rather not deal with a volunteer. It mm-hmm. doesn't work. So it's just, it's defining those roles, making sure that the people are needed and that the that department is receptive, and then uh, mm-hmm. having that ongoing communication and evaluation. And part Makes of that sense. you uncover you uncover through a survey. If you did a survey and you saw where the satisfaction of volunteers who are relating to a particular department or, or a particular person are not as high, then you know you got a problem. Yep, yep. Uh, here's one from Scott. I really like this question. Um, and I think the question itself will be valuable to people. Uh, how do you promote intergenerational volunteer opportunities? So like engaging um, parents and children to volunteer together, which first of all I think is a great idea and, and I think that that idea in itself is, 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 is worth hearing about for the attendees, but um, if you agree that that's a good idea, any advice on making that happen, Jeff? Well, I think, again, it goes back to uh, you know, what is it they're doing? Is it meaningful experience? And mm-hmm. is it something that's appropriate you know, for, those, for those generations uh, that, that they yep. all have a good experience? So if you're intergenerational, I mean, a lot of folks or programs I've seen have seniors and, and younger, like uh, elementary school or nursery school kids. Um, and so what is it that is the attraction for each group, and is it age appropriate for that group? Right. So that, that would be, and then how you promote it, how you get the, you know, but it's it's got to be, you know, is it something that, uh, that the parent and the the child at whatever age is going to really embrace and enjoy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Jeff, this was great. We're we're about out of time. I, I want to give uh, f- you time to to uh, once again talk about yourself. Maybe let people know how they can get in touch with you. I know we didn't get to all the questions uh, here before the end, but uh, fair to say you'd be willing to take additional questions by email and Twitter. Oh, and all absolutely. That good stuff. Feel free to email me. Thank you, everyone, for being here live or for uh, listening to the recording and would love to connect with you on social media and hope that you'll check out our website for our blogs and podcasts. We've got some great guests, including Stephen Shattuck on our, on our, on our <laughs> podcast. And, uh, and also um, every Wednesday, uh, I would be honored if you check out my blog, Bedrocks and Beacons at nonprofitpro.com. 
Yeah, definitely check out that stuff. Um, Jeff's column in Nonprofit Pro, their website is really good. Um, what did you write about? What monthly on there, Jeff? Just about? Uh, every week. Every week. Oh, weekly. Oh, yeah. Golly, yeah. yeah those are great every, articles. Every so Wednesday. definitely check yeah, those out. Yeah. Oh, you're Wednesday. Okay, I'll have to remember that. <laughs> um, do email Jeff. I know we didn't get to all the questions, and I apologize for that. I didn't want to keep people too long past the uh, two o'clock hour, especially if you haven't had lunch. Um, we also have some great resources on the Boomerang website. Uh, we have our daily blog posts, of course our weekly webinars, which you already know about because you're on one. Uh, lots of good stuff. Our podcast, our nonprofit wrap-up, which is our newsletter, which actually just went out today. So you'll see that on our blog. Um, some great stuff there. Uh, we are going to be back one week from today uh, to talk about integrated planning. We've got Sam Frank as our guest one week from today. Sam's a great guy. You may recognize him, uh, his name. He runs the Four Good webinars, uh, which is another really great, excellent webinar series. But he's going to take a break from administering webinars, and he's going to be our guest to talk, to talk about uh, integrated planning. So check that out. It's going to be a good one. We've got some great webinars scheduled all through the month of September and even beyond. So check out our webinar page. You may find some other topics there that interest you. Uh, we would love to see you again on another webinar. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking an hour out of your day. And uh, a special thanks to those of you who came back after our, uh, our technical snafu in June. And Jeff, of course, thanks again to you for hanging out with us. We love having you on here. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everybody. It's been fun. Right on. Well, look for an email from me. I'll be sending out the recording here very shortly. You'll get the slides again as well. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again next week. So have a great rest of your day. Have a great holiday weekend. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon.